Uh, we should probably go ahead and get started so that we can have maximum time for everyone to uh, converse uh, once we make our presentations. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, if you don't mind sitting on the floor, there's floor space. But we'll go ahead. A few years ago, it might have seemed eccentric, if not outright perverse, to suggest that music students' curricula should not include a series of courses forming a sequential survey of music history. That is probably no longer so much the case. Although most of our institutions do follow that model, a 2011 survey for the National Association of Schools of Music showed that approximately 90% of departments in a representative sample of 101 still required a survey in two, three, or four semesters. One in 10 were offering some alternative, and more were considering the possibility. Last year, at both the College Music Society and the AMS, discussion in formal sessions and conversations in lobbies and coffee shops highlighted the idea that we might consider eliminating conventional music history course sequences from our music major curricula. A new report just out suggests revising the entire undergraduate curriculum to focus students on the future rather than the past and to prepare them for a musical world of global cultural fusion. That's the report of the College Music Society's Task Force on the Undergraduate Music Major. And so we find ourselves here with the opportunity to explore why this might be appropriate or desirable, why it might be inadvisable or simply dreadful, and what the options are for dealing with these issues. The reasons for such a discussion include at least four questions, some historiographical and others pedagogical. One, how do we think of history? Two, how do we do history? Three, what do we want students to know? Four, what do we want students to do? How do we think of history? In the intellectual context of postmodernism, we find ourselves forced to regard any historical narrative with serious skepticism. For us, in the first quarter of the 21st century, time does not march forward along any path, even a halting and detour-filled one, in the direction of progress or decline. Nor does it consistently and perceptibly swing back and forth between poles for example, periods of Dionysian emotionalism, cyclically rescued from confused disorder by Apollonian intellectualism. <laughs> we cannot believe that we could produce any coherent pattern out of the mass of evidence left to us by the past. Meta-narrative has become anathema. How do we do history? As a matter of fact, few of us write history at all. Most of our work views moments in the past synchronically as though it were through a horizontal window. We offer detailed, vividly colored, multi-dimensional snapshots, as detailed and insightful as we can make them, on a point or short span of time. We write about a piece of music, a treatise, occasionally individuals or groups of contemporaries, but at most a few years or a generation, rarely longer. In a 2004 article, James Webster suggested the historiographical issues here, and I quote, issues of periodization altogether have been little discussed either by general historians or by musicologists during the last quarter century. This inhibition has, has multiple causes. The apparently simplistic overgeneralizing character of most period designations, the desire for objectivity in historical writing following World War II, the preference for thickly textured history and cultural studies as opposed to the traditional grand narratives, the attractions of meta-history and the anti-foundationalism, uh, I'm sorry, anti-foundationalist orientation of postmodernism. What do we want our students to know? If we ask what our students should learn, would we really say that we intend them to learn a history? More likely, we hope that from our teaching they will learn to bring to their performances or listening some understanding of period styles, performance practices, cultural contexts. When our music history courses take on topics in criticism, we try to get students to discuss the meanings of works or repertoires in relation to issues of gender, social structure, cultural values, or philosophy of their contemporary environments. What do we want our students to do? 
Much of the time, we probably expect our students in quizzes and tests to recognize styles, define terms, match composers to their contributions to the canon. We teach them to research information and to write essays. We ask them to present a classroom performance and report on the music they perform. We might even put them to work on such a musicological task as preparing an edition of a piece. None of this depends on an ability to create history or even on overall knowledge of the span of history. We all see, with perhaps varying reactions, the music of European art cultures of past centuries losing audience interest, monetary support, and live performance. If this is the direction of the future, we might argue that we have no business preparing students for careers based on those repertoires, with multiple semesters of study of musical traditions that can no longer form a significant part of actual musical experience. On the other hand, we could reply, if Western art music is worth preserving, it must be up to us to enable our students to preserve it. To a large extent, in fact, we now tend to think that music history pedagogy is oriented towards skills for students' practical future careers rather than knowledge. Knowledge doesn't seem as important as it once did. Whether we feel cynically that students won't long remember facts and ideas from music that they won't perform or might rarely or never hear, or whether we believe that students now have access to information so ready to hand in a wired or wireless age that nothing justifies their having to carry it in their heads, historical knowledge seems pretty unimportant. Our discussion might take any of many directions, including the following. Is the postmodern rejection of historical narrative compelling, or is it misguided? After the end of history, might we see new reasons to justify the writing of history? Is history something that our students should learn? Is a survey sequence an effective way to teach it? Should our emphasis be on teaching historical knowledge or on skills? What kind of curriculum options make best sense to a postmodern and digital generation? To what extent do we owe it to our students to help them meet national norms, expectations of them when they arrive at graduate schools, or accreditation standards? What are the administrative resources or obstacles we face in either continuing or abandoning the sequential music history survey course. We have a distinguished panel of discussants representing very different approaches to these issues. We hope that you all will bring your perspectives, concerns, and experiences to the conversation as well. Thank you. So as we move forward, we'll uh, introduce the three panelists. They'll each give uh, volume. So as we move forward, uh, we'll uh, introduce the three panelists, and they'll each give short position papers, and then we'll leave as much time in the session as possible for discussion, both amongst the panelists and with everyone who's here and pouring out into the hallway. Uh, two other quick things I'll announce very, uh, very briefly. We are filming this to uh, to uh, post later online. For many of the people who have been expressed interest in this panel and are unable to make it for a variety of reasons. In addition, there's a crowd uh, very interested in following this, this session on Twitter, so those of you who are so moved, please send updates to Twitter to those of our colleagues who cannot be here. Uh, and with that, let me begin by introducing Melanie Lowe, who is an Associate Professor of Musicology at Vanderbilt University's Blair School of Music. She's the author of Pleasure and Meaning in the Classical Symphony, co-editor of the forthcoming collection Rethinking Difference in Music Scholarship, and has published widely on 18th century topics, music in American media and music history pedagogy. Her teaching runs the gamut from high school students in Vanderbilt's pre-college program to adult professionals in the university's interdisciplinary master's program uh, in liberal arts and sciences, and it also from core courses in undergraduate music history like music and Western culture and J.S. Bach, learning musician and virtual traveler, to more critically oriented topical courses like music and sexuality and music and race in America. So Melanie, I'll turn it over to you. First, I cut my teaching teeth in the most luxurious of undergraduate music history curricula. Until 2010, we had at Vanderbilt a four semester music history sequence Two full academic years, 60 weeks of class time, devoted to the historical survey of Western art music. And yet, even with all that time and all the truly wonderful, useful, and increasingly variable teaching materials out there, the perennial problem remained insurmountable. Too much music, not enough time. 
My pedagogical strategy within that curricular framework will likely sound familiar. I would blast through lots of content, trying to cram it all in there, while strategically lingering every now and then on carefully chosen issues, ideas, persons, pieces, and contexts to get to the thick history, and to show how the, he the there and then of this history still speaks to us musically and otherwise in the here and now of today. Part of the problem is the notion of an all at all, not just that there is too much of it all, but that we as a discipline can't decide what it all would actually be anyway. And nor should we, of course. We've long since let go of universalist agendas in our scholarship, and the same aversion to hegemonic frameworks is now informing our teaching. There is an ever-growing body of literature on music history pedagogy that engages questions of not just how to teach, but what to teach. And much of this literature uh, challenges long-established grand narratives of music history, most notably the constructions of canon and chronology. My purpose today is not to rehearse or rehash any of those arguments. Um, I see many of their authors here, so I'm sure you can all speak for yourselves in the lively discussion that will follow. Rather, I will share with you some of the philosophical, pedagogical, and practical issues that shaped Vanderbilt's recent core curricular redesign in musicology and ethnomusicology, because that is what we now call these core courses. I should confess, though, that it hasn't been all smooth sailing. The curriculum we teach is as much a product of compromise and concession as innovation and collaboration. It's also early going. We are currently in our fifth year of teaching this new curriculum, so we've graduated only one class of students who went through the program start to finish. The verdict is still out. And it's still very much a work in progress. We're constantly tweaking and even wholly reworking parts of this thing. So after sharing the thinking behind our redesign and explaining briefly how the curriculum works, I'll step back and end with some reflections about its successes and some brutal honesty about ongoing challenges. Two guiding questions served as the launch pad for our curricular redesign. First, what musical historical knowledge do our students need to succeed in a wide variety of careers in and around music in the 21st century? And second, what music historical skills do they need to succeed in those various careers? Acquiring knowledge, acquiring skills while interrelated are ultimately different curricular goals and require different pedagogical strategies. As to the first goal, acquiring knowledge, vast oceans of music historical information is now always instantly available. It's literally in our students' hands at their fingertips, sometimes even during music history exams. <laughs> So in this information age, the purpose of a music history curriculum needs to shift somewhat. Um, to be clear, I'm not suggesting for a second that a music history curriculum uh, was the mere memorization, recitation, and regurgitation of facts masquerading as knowledge. I'm not suggesting that this ever defined undergraduate music historical learning for any of us in whatever kind of music curriculum we teach. But then neither would I maintain that learning some facts is a pointless waste of time or irrelevant for our iGen students. Simply put, in our curricular rethink at Vanderbilt, we found the second goal, the acquisition of skills, particularly information literacy skills, to overtake but not obliterate the first. We needed a curriculum in which students learned how and where to access reliable music historical information how to evaluate the information they find, and then how to use that information productively, meaningfully, and imaginatively across a stunning array of musical practices, contexts, disciplines, and ultimately careers. That stunning array of vocational applications, what our students do and what they want to do when they leave us, led to a third curricular goal, <laughs> to encourage and empower students to reflect on their own educational needs as part of their music historical curricular experience. Our, student, our students need to learn how to determine what needs to be learned. What music historical information, what critical methodology, what research skills, what analytical orientation, for example, do they need to be successful in whatever musical endeavors they choose? If not a wholly individual matter at the undergraduate level, neither is it one size fits all. 
So while we felt that there was at least some music historical knowledge, some kind of shared experience, and an essential skill set that students earning bachelor's degrees in music should have, we also needed a curricular flexibility and variability. To accomplish these somewhat conflicting core curricular goals, we jettisoned the two-year mythical journey from Euripides to Jennifer Higdon, and in its place, put in a new four-course experience in musicology and ethnomusicology. Here's how it works in a nutshell. In their first semester, all incoming freshmen take a lecture discussion course called Music as Global Culture. This course exposes students to indigenous musical cultures from around the world, considers Western musical cultures alongside them, and introduces various methods of ethnomusicological inquiry, which are then engaged in contemplating music, both world music and Western music, as global culture. Projects for this course include doing field work in and around Nashville, writing an ethnography, and composing or performing a piece of Western music that incorporates other music, however the student personally defines Western or other. The second course in the sequence, taken by second semester freshmen, is a writing seminar called Music in Western Culture. Enrollment is capped at 15, and space permitting, we sit around a table. This course is organized around issues and ideas, and all of us who teach it do it very differently. My syllabus is non-chronological, and the organizing themes are religion, politics, narrative, technology, gender, and the like. Beethoven, even, is one of my themes. So my students learn lots of varied repertory in this course. It's literally all over the place and they acquire some bits of the knowledge bases that go along with this repertory. To give one quick example, in the religion unit, we study the structure of the medieval mass and the history and musical flavors of the Protestant Reformation. But we also revisit the politics theme and consider some intersections of political expression and religious musical practices and forms from various historical periods. And that discussion ends up returning to the mass one by Bird and one by Bernstein. While exploring these intersecting themes in and around music history, our first year students are learning to speak about music in this course, many of them for the first time, in a small and hopefully safe environment. They've had a chance to get to know their classmates and peers by this point, and most are becoming reasonably comfortable taking risks with ideas as they begin to find their own musical intellectual voices. Our first year students also st uh, start to learn to write about music in this course. Because most of them have never written about music before, the writing exercises have to be carefully structured, incremental, and integrated not just into the content of the course, but into the classroom activities as well. To accomplish so many and varied curricular objectives in this one course, 15 weeks, lots of music gets cut. Those are really hard and often painful decisions. But the idea here is that students are acquiring transferable music historical skills that then they can then apply to different music literature according to their own individual needs and wants as they develop into, hopefully, more critically minded students and musicians. The third course in our sequence is music of the 20th and 21st centuries. This is the only chronologically oriented course in our musicology and ethnomusicology core, and it's just what it sounds like. It's a semester-long survey of the past century of Western music in a lecture discussion format. The course was actually inspired by a comment from a member of our applied faculty. He's a cellist, and he made this comment about graduate school auditions on his instrument. He said, the 20th century is now the new 19th century. <laughs> you could have been referring to the AMS program, I think, as well as the Michigan audition. <laughs> so, for many reasons, some applied and some musicological, we devote one quarter of our curriculum to the music of the most recent past century. The two required texts are Alex Ross's The Rest is Noise, and the third volume, the 20th century volume, of Peter's Norton Anthology of Western Music. I don't teach this course, but my colleagues tell me that our students are more receptive both to the music and to the course itself because of their experiences in our first course, Music as Global Culture. This course has given them a different and a more useful framework 
for engaging aesthetically challenging music. The fourth and final course in our sequence is a capstone experience that students choose from an ever-expanding menu of course options. These courses are the most research intensive and musicologically oriented in the core, and they focus almost exclusively on the common practice period. Some are small seminars with enrollments under 10, and others are medium-sized lecture discussion courses. To save time, I'm just going to list the titles that we currently have on offer, and I think the variety in content and of, of, of content and approach should speak for itself. Um, in no particular order other than catalog numbering, which makes no sense, but that's okay. Uh, here they are. Opera in the 17th and 18th centuries. Opera in the 19th century. Mahler symphonies, songs of irony. Music in the age of Beethoven and Schubert. Haydn and Mozart. Brahms and the anxiety of influence. The string quartet. Music in the age of revolution. J.S. Bach, learned musician and virtual traveler. Robert Schumann and the romantic sensibility. Music and the construction of national identity. These courses, by exploring mostly a single topic in considerable depth, model various methods of deep musicological inquiry. And the idea here, as in the Music and Western Culture seminar, is that the skills students acquire in the capstone experience are transferable to other music repertories, contexts, and histories. This variable capstone course also invites students to take more ownership of their music historical learning. In consultation with their academic advisor, their applied studio teacher, and sometimes parents and administrators, students select which of these courses best fits their educational needs and vocational aspirations. I'm about out of time, so I'll end with what five years into this curricular experiment I see as true successes and ongoing challenges. I'll start with the successes. By far the greatest success I see is that our students, for the most part, seem to truly enjoy and value their musicology and ethnomusicology coursework more than ever before. The evidence is not only a dramatic change in attitude. Our students come back for more. Many, if not most, music majors take more than just the required courses and credit hours in music history. Further, the curricular flexibility we offer our students extends to the faculty as well. Freed from the obligation to offer the same survey courses every semester of every year, the capstone courses are in rotation. So a sizable percentage of the enrollments in these courses are juniors and seniors who are taking the courses as music electives. So this makes for a healthy balance of younger students and more experienced students in these capstone courses. It's hard for me to narrow the successes down to just a few, but I'll mention one more that I notice every day just walking about around the music building eavesdropping on the undergraduate conversation. Our students seem to be more articulate about music in general. Um, you know, to be sure, there are lots of things that they just don't know. And sometimes those holes in their knowledge are frightfully wide. But what they do know, they have considered an appreciable depth for an undergraduate. And they speak about the variety of music and musical cultures intelligently, creatively, and with palpable confidence. Now to some ongoing challenges. The most common complaint comes mostly from our applied faculty. Um, they are very concerned about students not passing graduate <laughs> school music history placement exams. Ah, rather than engaging that complicated question right now, I'll defer to the discussion. I can talk about that for the rest of the day, but I won't. Um, I will simply do one thing. I will refer you to a really excellent report that addresses the graduate music history placement exams. This is in the 2011 NASM proceedings, and it is authored by my Vanderbilt colleague, Cynthia Cyrus, after doing lots of research uh, from around the country on these entrance exams. Uh, we can talk more about that whole issue in the discussion if it comes up. The other challenge I'll mention comes from within, and I will now offer that promised brutal honesty. Sometimes it's just plain hard for me to get out of my own personal music historical and pedagogical comfort zone. This comfort zone includes dependence on chronological thinking, linearity in course design, giving occasional agency to musical style, the analytical orientation of my own scholarship, and the inclination to survey broadly content with which I am less familiar. So while I've designed courses and have helped to design a curriculum, 
that bears witness to postmodern intellectual contexts, reflect an increasing discomfort with hegemonic frameworks, and dodge or disrupt music historical master narratives, I often find myself falling back to those more known spaces and comfortable stances even as I question them. From casual conversations with colleagues to my perusal of syllabi and purportedly progressive curricula to the few nods I just saw a minute ago, um, it seems that I have some good company in this comfort zone. Perhaps this persistent unease is both inevitable and okay, so long as we keep our curricular and pedagogical sights set on the needs and futures of our students, rather than the past or even the present of their professors. Thank you. And our second presenter, our second panelist, is J. Peter Burkholder, who is a distinguished professor of musicology at Indiana University and an honorary member and former president of the AMS. His research spans from Charles Ives to pedagogy and from borrowing to modernism, but he's best known as the author of A History of Western Music and the Northern Anthology of Western Music. Peter. Good morning. We've been talking about these issues a long time, and uh, when I was asked to participate on this panel, uh, pretty much cast in the role of the defender of the Music History Survey, <laughs> uh, I thought about uh, panels I'd been on before, and um, when I spoke on panels at the uh, Joint Toronto meeting in 2000 and at the National Association of Schools of Music meeting in 2001, I was the voice for change. My presentations were published in the CMS newsletter and as in proceedings, and I've reprinted them in my handout so that you have them in case they're still useful. And uh, Melanie and I were talking yesterday, we noticed some parallels between the curriculum she just described and some of the things that I said in those articles. On both panels, I pointed out the problem that we all felt then, summarized in the opening sentence of the CMS newsletter article, the most significant issue for teachers of undergraduate music history and literature courses is that there is far more music history and literature than there used to be. <laughs> so uh, part of this is that there's more music of all eras available in good editions and recordings. We have much more information about the past from composer biographies to patronage and social roles for music. We want to include repertories formally excluded from music by women to music from Latin America and the United States to popular music, jazz, and film music. And we want to go beyond the traditional history of musical style to discuss music in its context. I suggested some possible ways to restructure the curriculum in those talks, and the NASM article also suggests ways to deal with the vast expansion of the field of music history without changing the courses, and instead changing the material we include and our historical paradigms. And over the last 14 years, I've taken that latter course. I continue to teach a survey, and I continue to think that the survey uh, format has important strengths. I teach at a school of music, and all my students are music majors. During their careers, whether playing in an orchestra, touring as a soloist or in a chamber group, conducting a choir or band, or teaching, they are likely to encounter a wide range of music, and they will not have the time to explore the deep historical background of every piece they encounter. They need to have an overarching framework into which they can fit each new piece they engage with, and that framework is what a survey can give them. In order to be a good performer or teacher, I believe you need to know the history of your craft, from how to perform a trill, to why a piece has a particular form, to what a musical gesture means. Almost every question you can ask about music is in part a question about history. And those who know the history of the music they perform or teach will be much better performers and teachers. For both performers and listeners, another reason to know the history of music is because it brings music alive and makes it more meaningful. History can be a way of imagining what it must have been like to be a person living in another time and place with experiences in some ways very different from our own. If we imagine ourselves back into their world, we can hear and understand in their music something of what they heard in it, and that makes it come alive in ways we might never experience otherwise. But my students sometimes ask, why should I study the history of pieces I don't perform? Why, for instance, study music for an instrument other than my own? Well, composers, <laughs> composers write music all the time that imitates the sound or technique of other instruments or of pieces written for other media. 
Think of a Biagio Marini sonata imitating operatic recitative, a Bach organ fugue borrowing ideas from Vivaldi's violin concertos, Ravel's violin sonata in evoking the blues, or Cool from Bernstein's West Side Story combining cool jazz and bebop with modernist atonality and 12-tone methods. If you don't recognize these allusions to styles outside your instrument or your repertoire, you will miss the very point of the music and your performance is likely to be flat and uninteresting. Okay, my students might say, when I study the background to the music I play, I'll include other music of the period. But why should I study the history of music and periods whose music I don't perform? Well, there is lots of music that evokes or imitates music of earlier times. For instance, Donna Elvira's second aria in Don Giovanni. She comes on the scene just after Don Giovanni has persuaded Zerlina to come to his castle with the promise of marriage, and she sings an aria in which she says, Flee the traitor! Deceit is on his lips and falsehood in his eyes. From my sufferings, learn what it means to trust him. Be warned in time by my plight. While the words say one thing, but the music says another. This aria lacks the traits typical of Mozart, and instead has long overlapping phrases, uh, elaborate counterpoint, the same rhythm in every bar, which happens to be a very, very fast saraband, uh, an orchestra of strings only, and so on. These traits mark it as an aria in the style of Scarlatti or Handel from two or three generations earlier. Mozart is using an out-of-date style to satirize Elvira, who is striking a pose in this aria that is at odds with her real feelings. She would take Giovanni back in an instant if he wanted her, and the old-fashioned music helps us see right through her. That's Saraband, for instance. That's dignified when it's slow. <laughs> she is neither dignified nor slow. <laughs> this is a comic op aria. This is not a serious one. But you have to know the history of 18th century opera in order to cast the reference and get the joke and create a performance that treats this as a comic moment that reveals something about her character. So studying Mozart is not enough. In order to give a convincing performance of Don Giovanni and of a great many other pieces, you have to know enough about other music, including from earlier eras, to recognize all the illusions and understand what is going on. In other words, you need to have a framework for understanding this piece. And that framework consists of knowledge of other pieces with which you can compare it, of musical styles and genres, of terms and concepts that relate to these pieces, of how these pieces were performed and what their social function was, and of the social values these pieces reflect. You also must have a habit of skills of making such comparisons, of linking pieces to each other and drawing those connections. Having such a framework, both the knowledge and the skills, is essential for every working musician, every performer, every teacher of music. Now, I cannot possibly teach everything every one of my students needs to know about the history of every piece they will play or teach during their career. <laughs> I don't even know most of the music that they will encounter in their lives as musicians. What I have to offer is this overarching framework, an overall view of music and its history, which they can use to understand and to place any music they do encounter. That is the point of a survey course. The students will not remember every fact in it, Melanie well, referred to the thought that perhaps they wouldn't remember most facts in it. And they do not have to. Rather, they use the pieces we examine in the course to build their own sense of how music history went and where any piece they may encounter fits into that picture. This is why I think the survey still has an important role to play, especially an expansive survey that encompasses the entire Western tradition and everything from art music to popular music and jazz, musical theater, as well as opera, the Americas, as well as Europe. Of course, the survey course has to be designed so that students focus on creating this framework for themselves. And I try to make this happen by articulating goals, objectives, and themes for the course that focus on creating this framework, linking each topic we encounter to those objectives and themes, and designing in-class activities, quizzes, exams, and projects that address these objectives and themes using active learning techniques whenever I can. The last page of my handout shows the goals, objectives, and themes for my music history course this fall, my music history survey. And um, I made 150 of these. There are approximately 220 people here. So for the benefit of the folks in the back, um, I'll read or paraphrase these goals, objectives, and themes. The goals are broad. Um, enriching students' knowledge of music in the European tradition, including the Americas, 
their understanding of music in its context, and their sense of what the people who made, heard, and paid for this music valued in it, and what this music meant to them. By focusing on what people valued in this music and what it meant, I hope to engage students in thinking about their own values for music and the meanings they derive from it. The objectives then translate this broad goal into testable objectives, a specific set of skills like the ability to compare pieces uh, to each other, to describe music with appropriate vocabulary, including stylistic features, to recognize genres, um, uh, place it in a historical context, describe its uh, probable social function and the circumstances of its performance, and say something about uh, what those people who created, performed, heard, and paid for this music value in it. The themes then help to weave a fabric of history, linking days that seem far apart in time but are close in theme. The first three themes, the people who created, performed, heard, and paid for this music, the choices they made, why they made them, and what they valued in music, and how their choices reflect both tradition and innovation, have been central to my teaching for almost 30 years. They're the main themes that suffuse my textbook, and they are discussed toward the end of the NASM article in the handout. They show up almost every day. The other themes come up on some class days, but not others. For instance, the fifth theme, which is the means of disseminating music, comes up in relation to oral transmission of repertories like plain chant to the blues, uh, the impact of music printing, again from the 16th century uh, to, say, Tin Pan Alley, the role of recordings and radio in fostering the development of rock and roll and other blends, and so on. By invoking these themes as we take up each new topic, I hope to remind students that each era or region or composer or repertory we study has a place in a chain of development that led up to the music they're engaged with today. So I'm trying to, to weave a fabric, and this is part of the warp and woof of that fabric. These themes include the concerns of the traditional music history survey, such as styles and genres and how they changed, forms, music theory. But they also include aspects of the thick history we increasingly want to teach, such as where music happens and what functions it serves, aspects of performance, interactions with other arts. And they also include two of my favorite subjects, which are increasingly the focus of scholarly research and discussion, borrowing and reworking existing pieces of music to create new ones, and musical expressivity in all of its forms. All of these themes are designed to make connections between class days and repertories, and perhaps even more important, between people and pieces from the past and the current concerns of my musician students. Of course, I cannot do justice to any of these themes in one class or one year. Uh, I like to point out I can't do justice to anything, really. That's not what surveys are about. But what I, can introduce, what I can do is introduce them to my students and let them know that there is much more to explore around each of these topics and themes. A survey, I think, is a smorgasbord. It's a feast in small bites. It's designed to let you know what kind of food is out there and to give you a taste. Uh, the joy of a comprehensive survey is that it offers a kind of map of music history with everybody on it, so that the students in the room, all of the students, from viol players to trombonists, from singers to composers, from classical performers to jazz and pop artists, can locate themselves on that map and discover unsuspected connections to many of the other types of music that preceded or followed their own. It is that sense of a shared universe of music with an understanding of what each of these musicians do, why they do it, and what they value in the music they perform, compose, and pursue that I think is the real value of the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And our final uh, panelist for the uh, position paper is Don Gibson, who is currently the professor of music, or a professor of music, and dean emeritus at Florida State University, a uh, flautist and music theorist who previously taught or held uh, administrative positions at Ohio State University, Western Michigan University, Elon College, and UNC Greensboro. Of particular interest to our panel today, he also served as the chair of the commissions on uh, accreditation and as president of the National Association of Schools of Music. Don. Okay, I'd like to begin uh, with a few broad comments about NASM since I believe that's my function here today. 
Uh, to begin, there are approximately 640 institutional members uh, together representing all types of music programs in the United States. And this is the current membership. It continues to creep up. I say creep up because it gets a little bit larger every year, but uh, the large growth spurt for NASM happened probably 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, the N NASM standards, which are what we continually refer to, are consensus-based. They exist because people together believe they need to be there, and uh, they become part of our handbook. Uh, the next point I'd like to make is that NASM is actually your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to make that more clear as we get along here in a minute. Uh, accreditation or reaccreditation involves all aspects of the operations and curricular offerings of, of uh, a music program, such that if there, for one reason or another, happens to be a music curriculum offered outside the music unit, it is automatically considered part of NASM's business, even though it may not be the unit. So NASM actually accredits institutions. It does not credit uh, departments, schools, or colleges. Now, while all NASM standards are uh, available for review constantly, uh, there is a periodic model that we've employed for many years where we'll stop and take a look at one set of standards or one uh, body of curricular models or something of that sort. Now, during my three-year term as president, we focused on the current state of the professional baccalaureate degree in music. This is a Bachelor of Music degree, and it typically requires at least 65% music content. The BM degree stands in contrast to the Liberal Arts degree, or the BA, or BS as it's known, and that degree uh, has a larger share of required content dedicated to the liberal arts. This is one of the great misunderstandings, particularly for people in my generation and older, where the liberal arts degree tended to be where you would part the students who didn't have good jobs. <laughs> uh, we have uh, made much more of an issue out of emphasizing the fact that a BA degree actually asserts the liberal arts. It doesn't encourage dropping low-end music courses in there to fill up 120 hours. Well, through sessions offered at the NASM meetings during my presidency, we hope to provide a greater sense of opportunity for institutions to articulate and implement local solutions to the broad statements of content included in the NASM standards. While curricular models have always evolved, in some ways a traditional model has emerged and become a typical operating procedure. But this procedure is not the same as NASM standards. The standards articulate achievement goals and procedure. There is room to do things differently. As we considered how we might do things differently, however, we all felt the constraints imposed by our tradition-bound curricular model. At the same time, we found it difficult to identify content areas right for a change in priorities or even deletion. We accumulated these areas and our approaches to them for all the right reasons. Each area seems essential and our approaches are time-tested. However, during the past few years, curricular discussions have started within some NASM institutions, as we have noted here with Vanderbilt. And these discussions have not centered on the standards themselves, but rather on how the goals they contain can best be fulfilled in a specific institution at this time for students who have a future in music. The distinction between NASM standards and local approaches and procedures is really what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to, in the next 20 seconds, review everything NASM has to say about this topic. <laughs> this is important. The first a reference to anything that's like music history, music literature, is on page 83. The NASM handbook is what I'm referring to. If you go to the website, you pull up the current NASM handbook, it's all online. Uh, if you went to uh, page 83, you would find something called or Roman numeral 3, Standards for Accreditation, Music Program Components. So this is L, Content, Repertories, and Methods. Policies that establish a conceptual framework or guidelines for the application of curricular standards. Number one, NASM standards address bodies of knowledge, skill, and professional capacities. At times, the standards require breadth, at other times, depth or specialization. However, the standards do not mandate specific choices of content 
repertory or methods. Number two, with regard to specifics, music has a long history, many repertories, multiple connections with cultures, and numerous successful methodologies. Content in and study of these areas is vast and growing. Each music unit is responsible for choosing among these materials and approaches when establishing basic requirements consistent with NASM standards and the expectations of the institution. Three, in making the choices outlined in section 3.1 or L2 above, the institution is responsible for decisions regarding breadth and depth and for setting proportions among them. Four, choices and emphases as well as means for developing competencies reflect institutional and program purposes and specific areas of specialization. The result is differences among programs regarding attention given to specific content, repertories and methods, and to various perspectives through which music may be studied. The next reference uh, has to do with standards for the liberal arts degree. It's on page, pages 95 to 96. And we stay here. Students holding undergraduate liberal arts degrees must have, one, the ability to hear, identify, and work conceptually with the elements of music such as rhythm, uh, melody, harmony, structure, timbre, texture. Two, an understanding of and the ability to read and realize musical notation. Three, an understanding of compositional processes, aesthetic properties of style, and the ways these shape and are shaped by artistic and cultural forces. And four, and this is the, the relevant one, an acquaintance with a wide selection of musical literature the principal eras, genres, and cultural sources. Five, the ability to develop and defend musical judgments. The third and final section having to do with the undergraduate curriculum is the statement attached to the professional degrees, the performance degrees, major in music theory, music composition, and so forth. And it is number four uh, on uh, uh, page 108B, history and repertory. Students must acquire basic knowledge of music history and repertories through the present time, including study and experience in musical language and achievements, in addition to that of the primary cultural uh, source encompassing the area of specialization. That's it. <laughs> now, to put this in a slightly different light, uh, the following words cannot be found anywhere in the NASM handbook. Baroque. <laughs> Maybe Renaissance, Contemporary, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, etc., etc. It doesn't get any close, it does not get close to that language. It is very interesting because I had mentioned much earlier that NASM is your friend, and here's why it's your friend. Uh, having wandered through this terrible fiscal crisis that we've been going through and are still going through. Uh, when pressure comes to bear on institutions and music programs with more faculty members than anyone thinks they should have find themselves trying to defend their positions, NASM makes it clear that this kind of content is essential to music. Now, it's not going to make it detailed at the point where, uh, you know, you can justify 13 different subspecializations, but it won't do that for anything. Um, I'll give you another interesting uh, detail. I did, probably 20 years ago, an NASM evaluation in an institution called Musicians Institute in Hollywood. Musicians Institute is a for-profit school specializing in rock and roll. It was uh, owned and run by uh, a man from Japan who sold guitars on the side. Excellent program, by the way. Terribly methodical and very structured and very difficult to get through. Uh, they passed muster with regard to these standards. And I can assure you it wasn't because they had a curriculum that had a whole lot to do with what we've been talking about today. So, in summary, NASM advocates for no particular position regarding the overall model for our undergraduate music content. While our traditions and habits tend to move us towards similar models of curricular content, the NASM standards themselves do not do this. Quoting from an earlier reference to these standards, choices and emphases as well as means for developing competencies reflect institutional program purposes and specific areas of specialization. The result is differences among programs regarding attention given to specific content, repertories and methods, and to various perspectives through which music may be studied. And so, your friend in ASM, 
encourage each of you to make an ongoing practice of revisiting the content and time allocation of coursework you provide in music history. Higher education in the United States has always been praised for the broad diversity of institutional types available to our students. Wouldn't it be something if each of our institutions articulated a curricular model that reflected the unique nature of their programs, institutions, and settings? On the other hand, NASM is going to be just as happy with you if you deliver a very tr a traditional curriculum. Thank you. <laughs> that I might ask uh, the panelists to, to address. Um, and not necessarily any of these to uh, any one of you, except that I will tell you um, who was talking when I thought of the question. <laughs> um, and, and so the first one was one that came to mind when, when Melanie was talking and she was saying, um, there is no all, um, and, and so I wondered how you would respond to the idea, if there's no all, is there an any? Is there anything that students must know? Am I reaching for this, really? <laughs> go, Melody, go. Oh. Uh, you know, Douglas, I, I think you've nailed it. Um, I, I mean, I think that is really the question that's behind all of it. Um, and we all probably, there is, are as many opinions on that question as people in the room. And I might have one opinion and, and everyone else a different one. Um, from a curricular perspective, uh, that was kind of what I was getting at when I said that our curriculum was a product of uh, compromise and concession as much as imagination and collaboration. Um, I didn't get everything I wanted, and I don't think my colleagues got everything they wanted. And I, I know we please some of our applied faculty. And, Others, not so much. Um, and I, I, I don't know if there's an all or an any, um, but I can only tell you what we did. We did decide that there is uh, at least some basic music historical knowledge that we felt to give a bachelor's degree in music to these students, they needed to know these things. And our curriculum addresses that. But it also leaves open the question of what they actually do need. So I'm really kind of dodging that. Um, but, but really, thinking of, uh, thinking of um, from a curricular perspective, that does seem to be the question, and we compromised uh, on that. But maybe Peter has some thoughts on it. Um, I tend to think more in, in terms of types. Than, uh, so for instance, um, uh, one, uh, we used to ask the question, of which Beethoven symphony shall we teach? And you know, maybe we don't need a Beethoven symphony. Um, but I think, <laughs> but I think skipping Beethoven entirely would be a mistake because Beethoven is a tidal force, uh, and a lot of music history doesn't make sense without Beethoven. Um, so I think that's that's where I would would go uh, when you when you ask what should be covered. Uh, I think it will constantly be in negotiation and constant change. Um, but what I'm looking for is impact, broad impact, broad effect, and sometimes that's music that is really not very well known, um, and yet there is a very broad impact to that. That's one reason why I always include the ancient Greek music when I teach the first half of the survey. Uh, this stuff is not important for centuries, and then it's crucial. It's just absolutely crucial. Okay. Uh, 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 development of chromaticism in the 16th century as an effective device, the idea of opera, uh, Wagner, none of that makes any sense without the ancient I'd actually just like to add one thing since Peter brought up Beethoven. Um, I, it was uh, a lot of thought about Beethoven because, you know, I think probably if there's one composer that we really would feel very uncomfortable for students to be granted a bachelor's degree and go, Beethoven, who's that? <laughs> Is that possible? No, nobody wants this. Uh, but the way that I've gotten around that, which Beethoven symphony, rather than teach Beethoven as a composer or teach Beethoven as a, as a collection of symphonies or music literature, I teach Beethoven as an issue. And he is literally a theme, so I have, you know, technology, gender, uh, narrative, Beethoven. Not a composer, but a theme, an issue uh, that guides the kind of curricular conversation and the content of the course. So maybe that's really trying to get at it, um, just Beethoven from a different angle. Maybe 
push that over to Don, and I'll oh, just no, ask, I'm, ask I'm this question. Don, no, no, <laughs> seriously. Just delighted there. So you go, to a, you go to an NASM school to do a reaccreditation visit, and you discover that they have eliminated Beethoven. What's your reaction to that? Do you have a reaction to that from the point of view of the standards and your sense of them? Uh, I'm sure that it would be a conversation point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I can also say that it wouldn't become an accreditation point. It would actually get beyond that. It would, however, certainly stir up conversation. Uh, and maybe a conversation is the most important thing. Um, uh, Melanie were, and I were talking yesterday, and, and we pretty much agreed that more than what the result is, the most important thing is to continually have the conversation, to continually question ourselves and not, not just do things, as she said at the end of her talk, not just do things because we used to do them or because our teachers did them. Colin. Just to ask a quick follow up on that. Uh, in past years, one of the conversations that's come up in the various pedagogy study group sessions is people with a skepticism of the word cover, as in we need to cover material, and the goal of the music history course is to cover the survey and cover the history. And since you just used that verb, Peter, I wonder if, I, well, I, I wonder if you can, you and Melanie can maybe comment on, is this a problematic phrasing for us as musicologists? Is there another term or another word that may come in more handy that, or that may represent how you think about the surveys uh, in the undergraduate curriculum better than cover? I'll just say briefly that the question I've, I've reframed it. It's not so much what I want my students to know, which I think kind of is more to cover things that they should know. I want to know what they can do. And so it's much more an issue of giving them access to some things to know and then allowing them to play with them and do things with them. Because I'm never going to be able to, to cover what they need to know. I, I could never even identify what, you know, let's say in any given year I have 50 undergraduates. Um, I'm making that number up. Sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 200, but whatever. I, there's no way I'm going to know what these individuals are going to need. What should I cover for them? But allowing them to actually develop the tools, the critical tools toolkit, to apply to what they need to know, um, I think is really the only strategy that makes sense to me. So what I cover are, are, are strategies of inquiry, not content. It's, I mean, of course there's content, but that's not really uh, the, the basement. Um, it's more the toolkit. I would agree with that. Yeah, sorry for using the word. Uh, there's a great essay out there uh, written by a historian about uncovering. Um, and uh, sorry, I can't quote chapter and verse off the top of my head, but the, um, uh, it's about the idea of in, um, uh, getting the students to figure out how to uncover what happened in the past and discover and re, you know, reframe that. I often find that if I try to cover something, it's, it's a lost class. If, if, I'm, if I'm after covering something, then I haven't really thought about the material. But if I, if I instead of lecturing on it, I give them an activity, even in a, a lecture class of 150, if I give them an activity to do with it and I uh, lead them through the material themselves, that's, that's why I referred to the act of learning um, uh, in my talk, that, that is what um, really makes progress. So, so uh, I agree with you. Uh, to follow up on that, actually, and then uh, I'm going to just do one, throw out one more to you, and then I'm going to open the floor. Um, Colin can moderate from the other. Um, and that Don is. Wants to say something. No, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that is the question of: Is the solution to the issues that we're dealing with a curricular? I mean, are we dealing with a curricular problem or are we dealing with a pedagogical problem? That was basically the point of what I was saying, is that I, I, <laughs> I think reframing uh, the survey in terms of these, uh, these skills and these themes uh, produces not, it's, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a brick wall, it's not a foundation, it's not everything they ever need to know, it's a sort of safety net. It's a, um, a set of relationships, it's a network of ideas, um, and, or it's a map. Um, and on, on that map or on that um, fabric framework of, of interconnections, I think students can then, uh, or working musicians can then, find a way to attach or to, to link what they're dealing with, uh, to plot that on the map, to, to find it in the weave. 
Uh, I think it's, it's actually both, and I think it really comes down to the relationship that our students have to knowledge or information is very different from the relationship that I think most of us have to knowledge or information. Um, I think of where knowledge resides, and it sort of resides in my head, and then I pull things down when I need to work with it, and sometimes shove it back, or sometimes, you know, vote it off the island. But, mm -hmm. but it kind of lives here for me. Um, for our students, it lives there. It's in the cloud, and it's networked, and it's, it's very much a kind of collective ownership of a, di a diffuse world of knowledge. Um, and I think being mindful of that fundamental difference in what's important, how they learn, where information resides, and what they do with it, just to access it. When I access knowledge, I kind of sit down and be quiet and pull it from this place. But when they access knowledge, they go out. And that is a huge change in the traffic. Um, and, and then so teaching them how to navigate what really is a kind of uh, information congestion and how to figure out what it is that they need and how to use and how to assess and how to determine if this is valuable or a bunch of garbage, that to me is, is, is huge and essential because they're just flooded with these oceans of facts and information and they don't know what to do with it. But I think the main thing is that you know, our, our kind of intellectual structure and where knowledge resides is in a very different location. And I think we have to address that both from a curricular standpoint and a pedagogical standpoint, not just the kind of framework of course op options, but what we do when we're actually in them, whether that's in a survey or in some sort of, uh, you know, topically oriented or whatever we're doing, I think it's really, both things are interconnected and we can't separate them. Don, did you want to say anything about NASM and pedagogy as opposed to curriculum? No, I, I have a, a footnote, however, that I'm going to throw in here uh, before I forget. Uh, the, the comment about uh, some of the applied faculty being concerned about passing muster at the graduate level. Mm -hmm. uh, we went through an, an interesting exercise with this, uh, which we won't go into any details about, but we will land on this fact. The exam that we have traditionally given uh, at the graduate level is not a requirement of NASM. It's important to know that. Very few people uh, understand that to be the case. They think that there is an exam required and it has this content and if you don't do it then we've got a problem. That is not true. Once again, NASM's approach to this is much broader than that and it has to do with the notion that you ought to be building a master's degree on top of bachelor's degree content and, and skill. That is the idea. But, you know, we have traditionally pulled out both music theory and music history as areas to do special exams in, and arguably there's no more cause for that than there would be to do an exam in uh, sight singing and an exam in class piano and an exam in whatever you want to give it in. It's all kind of the same, except these are things that our traditions have reinforced continuously over the years. So I wanted to make that clear. If we ever got to the point where we were free enough with this, then that concern could go away. Why don't you take over and we'll see what people have to say from the floor. So we'll turn the questions over to you guys now. If you'll come up to the microphone to ask them, uh, just so we can hear it on the camera, and so everyone in the back and in the hallway can hear as well. Uh, go ahead. No. There you go. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for this really important uh, panel. Uh, my name is Dan DiCenzo. I teach at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I wanted to make a very brief observation and then ask a question. I teach, uh, I'm a medievalist by trade, but also teach popular music, and I'm uh, often, because of the scheduling of our courses, transitioning from James Brown to Gregorian chant. Uh, and a very quick uh, transition period. And at some point I came to realize that just about everything that I do and everything that I teach is both ancient music and foreign alien music from outside the culture, and that very little music that we teach is part of uh, what students would call their own. And I wonder if sometimes uh, the dichotomy that we make between Western and non-Western art and pop, uh, ours and theirs, 
uh, isn't a preoccupation of our own training, much more so than a practical preoccupation on the ground for students, where the, uh, whether it's a smorgasbord or a Whitman sampler approach, uh, is necessary even for those things which we believe to be the most canonical of the canonical, uh, because they're not really canonical to them. Uh, the second the question that I really had, though, is uh, in a misspent period of my life, I uh, did a doctoral degree in education theory, straight up education, not music education, before I did a PhD in musicology. And it strikes me in all these conversations that we are often so preoccupied with the content and the skills that will find themselves on the cutting room floor uh, during these uh, negotiations that it might be, might be, uh, easier to have a conversation about, or at least more disentangled, to have a conversation about the conceptualizations and history of curriculum theory as it has played out in this country and in Western institutions from Europe and so on and so forth. Because it seems to me that we tend to conflate a lot of different anxieties into a single moment, which has both to do with the fact that Beethoven may be on the cutting from the floor, that there are pedagogical ways of doing things that we want to hold on to, and we have concerns about the type of courses, uh, the curses that we're forming. But because we don't disentangle those things, uh, we in a certain sense make the conversation even harder than it has to be, uh, where I would suggest that maybe coming to a philosophical agreement on matters of pedagogy and course, cursus, uh, before infusing questions about uh, the content itself may help, it may not, uh, and I don't know what the panelists think about that. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd actually just make a, uh, I'll share something. When I teach St. Augustine, I actually play James Brown. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. I play I Feel Good, as we know it, but actually the title of that song is I Got You. And to talk about the question of what is you, who are you, and the distraction of music. Um, and, you know, you can think of it, James Brown, I got you, but maybe for St. Augustine the problem was, I got you. And it was a really big, big problem. And the relationship that students have to James Brown and how good they feel hearing it, they're distracted from the content of what we're doing, which is here to study chant. And then all of a sudden, in that moment where they're distracted by James Brown, they get St. Augustine's problem. So for whatever that's worth, um, I think these things can actually really be put together and bounce off of each other in incredibly productive ways that spark the light bulb in, in their moment. As to your other really brainy question, I'm gonna let Peter feel that. <laughs> I pass. Hey, if I can jump in on, on your second question just a little bit though. Uh, one thing that's important to remember from the perspective of music history and musicology is that the scholarship on music history pedagogy is still very new and very much a growing field. Uh, uh, Mary Natvig's book was published in what, 2000, 2001, uh, and that was the first kind of monumental uh, book on this. The newest, latest evolution in this scholarship is starting to address that question of what is the history of pedagogy and why do we do what we do and where does this come from? And uh, at the moment, I know of a couple of dissertations that are doing that, and they're just starting to go into articles and. I think we're going to see more of that and have much more access to that kind of knowledge in, in the next few years. So stay tuned to the Pedagogy Study Group, too, because we'll help publicize that and broadcast that. I would just suggest, and we don't follow that, but I would suggest that there's a whole world. No, we of need the microphone. Back to my phone. But more just to say that there's a whole, there is a history of curriculum and a history of pedagogy theory. I think this is exactly the musicological yeah. response that we want to know what it is with respect to what we do specifically, and I think that there's much to be offered by simply reading disentangled, theory that's disentangled uh, from, from the history of music specifically. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry. I'm, my name is Matt Baumer. I was the former chair of the Pedagogy Study Group, and I teach at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, my question is um, kind of related to the educational theory aspect of what uh, Daniel was talking about, which is to say that um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of this notion that because we can carry Wikipedia in our pocket that we're all somehow smarter than we used to be or that knowledge is somehow less important than it used to be. Um, when I started in, in musicology, uh, there was similarly way more information than I ever could have taken in in the library at Chapel Hill. And I wonder if 
that situation is really so different now. Um, I also wonder if um, you're supposed to be able to to um, use skills in order to do these things. Um, you're mentioning evaluate sources, for example. Can one really evaluate sources without a certain amount of knowledge? Um, and and maybe that knowledge is, is the survey. Maybe the knowledge is more. Uh, maybe maybe the knowledge is more a knowledge of these issues and things that, that Melanie was talking about um, in her classes. But I'm I'm wondering, can we really uh, assume that um, the way people are able to make sense of information can be divorced from that base level of knowledge? I, I'm wondering if maybe there's educational theory that could speak to this also. Um, that, that people are not really able to make these critical connections and, and ask these kinds of questions without that, that basis of knowledge. Um, I, I can say one thing that comes to mind about the difference between the library and our phones. The phone is in my pocket. The phone is in our students' pockets. And for them, um, to go to the library and to look something up is a huge commitment. And they can Google it and get that information there. So on the one hand, I think we're really dealing with a very different relationship to where information lives and how we access it. But the other thing is just the, the way that we wouldn't believe everything that we can call up on our phones, we shouldn't believe everything in the library just because it's in print. So it's really the same fundamental question. How do you access information? How do you evaluate it? And then what do you do with it, having determined whether it's useful or not? So on the one hand, I think the skill set is, you know, is actually remarkably similar and does require a certain type of knowledge to, to get to those places where you're comfortable using your skills. Um, but the place that the, the, the information resides because it's so fundamentally different and the access point and time commitment is so different, um, I think we have to kind of shift how we train our students um, to access. How do you access information and then what can you do with it? Um, so I think there's similarities and differences there. I would simply add that I do think that we need uh, uh, some basic knowledge of anything in order to, for the next piece to make sense. Um, uh, my students seem to capture what is, in some sense, the next piece of the puzzle. That they retain. And if it's a fact over here or something else that doesn't connect, um, it doesn't make sense to them. And that's, that's why I try to emphasize connections of any sort. Uh, connections going in many different dimensions. Um, because whatever we're talking about, I hope we'll catch somewhere on that, um, that vast structure. Thank you. Uh, Scott Moorfield, I teach at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and uh, just background, 60,000 students, second largest university in the United States, 38,000 undergraduates, music department, about 300 with about 24, 25 faculty. I am the only musicologist. And my point here, uh, I look at the panel, and we have two of the largest schools of music, uh, two flagships, and one of the best uh, endowed liberal arts colleges and universities in the country. And I don't, I, certainly you have things we probably envy, you have problems we don't envy. And I'm just, what I'm trying to get at here is that we have very different uh, resources. I'm thinking that where I am is probably more real world, or at least there are a lot of people out there where we're the only person or maybe we're not even, for instance, my music history sequence is taught by a performer. I won't name the instrument to put him on the spot. He does medieval through Bach. And what I see when I get to the advanced ones, uh, a lot of holes. Uh, the other half of the sequence is taught by uh, an instructor who is more interested in piano and other things, uh, not really a scholar. I have, have been assigned mostly graduate teaching and such. So in a situation like this where we have less resources, I, you know, I look at what Melanie has, and I'm wondering, when you talked to the dean, you said something about capping a class, and that was amusing to me. Um, <laughs> I don't need this microphone. I lecture to as many as 300 people at a time uh, to, to earn money for the department so we can do things. And Peter, again, has large classes, and Doug, and you have systems with GTAs and whatnot that are in place. Uh, I'm just wondering how any of this is going to filter down to us. Uh, Peter's survey, for instance, is the book, and not just Peter's, but we have two or three other major pretty good surveys that are available so that, for instance, when this person, this performer who's assigned our history, he just asked me which of the three surveys was we use and then grabbed the book. And so a lot of places music history is going to be taught simply by whatever system, textbook, or whatever is out there based on what you guys have prepared for us. And I'm wondering what Melanie does is sounds sort of like heaven for us who are musicologists. 
but Peter's is going to be the real world solution. I'm wondering if there's any way those two will ever meet and how will it come down to, uh, shall we say, less distinguished institutions or maybe less uh, resourced institutions? I think there are ways for them to meet. Uh, I actually suggest a couple of those in the NASM article, if you got the handout, um, uh, including assigning the textbook and then teaching the course in a different way. So um, uh, my colleague at the University of Wisconsin, actually in the history department, John Barker, used to teach a one semester course that he called um, uh, Music, the Arts, and History. And uh, what he would do is not try to uh, teach a continuity, but he would, for instance, parachute into Venice from 1580 to 1610 and um, talk about the history of the Venetian Empire and, and the, um, um, the arts and the, the sponsorship of the other arts. And then he'd talk about music and particular composers and do a kind of thick history of that moment. Um, and meanwhile, he was having the students read the whole textbook at that point, uh, the grout. Um, and um, that way he could relegate to the textbook the continuity while he did the focused teaching that he wanted to do as a historian. So, um, so that's, that's one possible model. Um, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I mean, the, the flip side would be to um, not have a textbook at all, uh, teach the continuity yourself, and just uh, pick up the pieces that you want to teach and the articles you want them to read and, uh, or use source readings. So there, there's, uh, there's lots of different ways, but precisely for the problem that you articulate, um, I, wanted, I knew I had the responsibility in, in writing the textbook to represent music history. And so I thought of myself as um, the steward of a shared resource um, and tried to listen to as many people as possible in designing it and make sure that it was all-encompassing so that if your colleague teaches a class and leaves out all the Latin American music, the students still notice that it's mentioned. Uh, if they leave out all the jazz and popular music, the students still notice that there are chapters on that. And so it's represented in what we think of as music history. Music history encompasses all these things, even if your course doesn't. If I can follow that real quickly, because it's for, for Don then. Uh, the issue of when people who are not necessarily qualified teach the course, um, does the NASM, again, uh, and you guys did great work for us because the last time we were accredited, we helped shut down a really bad pseudo master's degree in the ed department since it was cross campus. So the NASM is our friend. Uh, now, I can I ask you as a friend again to uh, what does the NASM say about courses that are taught by people without, without the qualifications, again, music history being taught by somebody perhaps with a, a master's degree in performance as opposed to uh, a genuine uh, musicologist or somebody with the, the, the degrees? And again, how can you help us to get deans and whatnot to put those lines where they should be? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, first, I will indicate that uh, NASM, interestingly enough, would be less apt to poke at that than a regional accreditation, SACS specifically would. Uh, we just went through uh, SACS on my way out of the dean's uh, office. I felt that I missed my exit by at least a year. <laughs> uh, you know, I was given spreadsheet after spreadsheet so they could explain to me why uh, this trombone player had the uh, chops to be a coordinator. Whereas I figured, hey, it's my job. You know, I took care of that. Don't worry about it. That really uh, is bureaucracy run amok. I mean, it is an incredible waste of time, and it has nothing to do with quality or ensuring it. Now, what NASM asks for is uh, a kind of a brief demonstration of your faculty, broadly speaking, their preparation in their areas of teaching. If there are areas of concern to the institution, typically what happens is we'll read about that in the uh, self-study. Where the institute, and this is where it's important to be clear in the self-study. If you have, if you think you have a question about something, you should raise it, and then what happens is it would put a light on it, and uh, at that point, probably the best example of a kind of situation where NASM might come in wouldn't it actually be in music history, but or typically maybe in music education. I remember one institution that I did had three half-time people taking care of music ed, and of course you've got all these outside